good morning. Why don't you say hello to one another as you're seated. Just a reminder, um, we are going to have an Operation Overwatch update today, and what we'll do is when this message concludes, we'll close out Facebook and everything else, and we will meet back in here at 1130 if you care to stay for that. If not, we'll see you next week. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 5. Lord willing, we'll finish out this chapter this morning. Luke chapter 5, verses 30 through 39. The title of the message this morning is, Are You Saved? Funny topic for a message in a Christian church, huh? Verse 30 begins, And their scribes and Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Lord, we thank you for your word. It is always amazing, always challenging, sometimes convicting, but always the truth. And Lord, I pray that you open our hearts and our minds this morning to hear your truth as it's presented here today. Lord, we pray for those who can't be with us this morning. Um, and we are missing a couple families here. as Joni and Ron and, and her mom, and his mom rather, and uh, John are not here with us as they're suffering from sickness. As Barry and his mom and, and his aunt and uncle also, Lord, we just lift them up to you now. Pray for your healing hand upon them. Pray for your protection. Lord, we pray for Phyllis as well as she's still going through the chemo. Lord, give her the strength to endure. We pray for Keith with his upcoming test, Lord. Be with him as well. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for the wonderful outcome of Joe's surgery and how he's recovered so quickly. Lord, thank you for bringing our brother back among his family here. So Lord, we are just amazed by what you're doing, what you have done, and Lord, we're excited to see what you're going to do. We ask all these things in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So you've got to understand what the Pharisees are asking of Jesus. See, how are you, a rabbi, a holy man of God, associating with the dregs of society? And Jesus responds in such a way that would have stopped them in their tracks, right? He said, I didn't call, come to call the, those who believe they're righteous. That's not who I came for but those who know they're sinners, those who know that they're the dregs of society, but they don't want to remain that way. Now, he didn't come for those who think they're righteous, those who believe they're righteous, and I believe he's referring to the Pharisees here, and they probably felt the same way. They're talking, he's talking about them, because they believe that by following the law, that's what made them righteous, that's what saved them. And so there would be no need for them to repent. What would they repent of? I mean, they're saved. They're saved by keeping Torah, right? They're good. They believe that because they followed the law so fanatically that they were saved. There was also another caveat here. They were descendants of Abraham, which they also believed was a one-way ticket into heaven. But what about today? Are there professing Christians out there who believe that because of their righteous works, because of what they've done in Jesus' name, that they're saved. Now, we know from Jesus' words on the Sermon on the Mount that there are many, many who will call out to him in those last days who consider themselves saved but are not. Jesus said these chilling words, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 
And I got to tell you, when the first time I heard this verse taught in Calvary Chapel, Old Bridge, this scared the bejesus out of me. This is a hard verse, right? This is a hard saying. Because it really, it should, it should make you think, wow, is that Jesus going to say that to me? There's something here, though, that Jesus says that gives us the clue to who he's speaking to. He says, have we not, and some translations might say, did we not? Did we cast out demons? Have we, didn't we cast out demons? Have we not done many wonders in your name? And that's what that word, that word wonders in the Greek means works. Haven't we done many good works in your name? But shouldn't it be about what Jesus has done? Not what they've done, not what we've done, but what Jesus has done. Shouldn't it be all about his finished work on the cross, that there's nothing for us to do to earn our salvation? And the point Jesus is making here is that they did this in their own strength because they were never empowered by the Holy Spirit to do these things. And if they were never indwelt or empowered by the Holy Spirit, then they were never truly saved, were they? But here's the really scary part about this passage of Scripture. They believe with all their heart that they were saved. They believe that they were made righteous by their works, just like the Pharisees did. So how could you make such a terrible mistake? How could you get this so wrong? And what would that look like in the church today? Now, Pastor Al, who was here last week, reminded us that there's three types of believers are three types of people in any in a church on any given Sunday right do you remember that he said there's believers there's non-believers and there's make-believers now maybe you've heard that before but what is a believer what is a believer and we're going to go over this in a little more detail toward the end of this message but a believer confesses that they're a sinner right they repent of their sin they trust in Jesus for their salvation and for the forgiveness of their sin and if you've repented and continue to repent and you've submitted your life to Jesus and surrendered your will to him, then Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Then you're saved. So what's a non-believer? Well, that is self-explanatory, isn't it? That's someone who has not at least yet put their trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. So third is a make-believer. And that category needs a little bit more explanation. And this is the group I believe Jesus is speaking to. So you might ask, how can this group, make believers, sit in church every single week and not be saved? How is that even possible? Well, let's say you were brought up in a Christian home, okay? You attended church all your life. You never really understood why you were going to church, but it just felt good. It felt like it was the right thing to do. You grew up going to youth functions, attending youth groups, you went to church with your parents every Sunday. You got married to a girl you met in youth group who had a similar background. And so you begin a family of your own. You do all the right things for your family, right? So you take them to church when you can. Unless there's something more pressing in your life that day. You make sure, though, you're in church on Christmas and Easter. That you make sure of. You tithe when you're at church. You volunteer when you can. Maybe even serve at the local soup kitchen. You know Jesus. You've known him all your life, it seems. So when you're in church and the pastor gives the gospel message and he asks if there's anyone here who wants to have a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus, you don't come forward. You don't think he's speaking to you. You know Jesus. You grew up knowing Jesus. You grew up saying his name, attending church functions, going to church, doing church. And you think, that altar call wasn't for me. I'm saved. Are you? Are you? You know, I asked the guys at men's group yesterday what it would take to make a believer, or make believer rather, cross over that line and become a believer. So I'm going to ask you the same question this morning. What would it take for a make-believer to cross that line and become a believer. Any guesses? Hmm? No one knows. How about confession of your sins? How about repentance of your sins? How about a start? How would we start there? But what if you grew up in the church and you fell through the cracks? 
Your parents never made that clear to you, that this needed to be your own profession of faith, that you needed to confess your sin and repent of your sin and turn to Jesus. What if they never really made that clear to you? They're just happy that you go to church, right? They're just happy you get up on Sunday, get dressed, and go to church with them. And so what if they believe that the church leaders, the Sunday school teachers, went over this with you? And what if your Sunday school teachers and the leaders in the church believe that your parents went over this with you? You see how easy it could be to fall through the cracks? So you grow up thinking all along that you're saved because, well, well, you've been in church all your life. You've known Jesus all your life. But listen, just knowing Jesus, just saying his name, just doing good works in his name, just being a righteous person just will not save you. Only being covered by his blood can do that. You can only become righteous when he imputes his righteousness to you. So when the pastor asked if anyone wanted to come forward and be saved, he was talking to you. But because you felt that being in church every Sunday, being in church when you can, being a good person, doing good works, meant that you were saved because you've been doing this all your life. What else could I be? You missed it. You missed it. You miss the whole meaning behind what it means to be a believer. And it's scary to think that someone can slip in and out of church on Sundays, hear the gospel message, and think that it doesn't apply to them because they were raised Christian. You know, there are more professing Christians in this world today than there are true Christians. Think about that for a moment. If everyone who professes that they are a Christian was truly a Christian, do you think this world would be in the shape that it's in today? Do you know the Pharisees believed that because of who they were from, from the seed of Abraham, that they were saved? As John the Baptist was baptizing in the Jordan, many scribes and Pharisees came to watch. And so John, one of my favorite people in the Bible, as he always did, he never minced words, right? He lashed out at them, asking them, what made you think that you could escape the judgment to come? So that had to get them their ears had to perk up when they heard that. John knew the answer. He knew that they believed just because they were descendants of Abraham that they were saved. Because they were raised in a God-fearing, Torah-keeping home that they were safe from the judgment of God to come. So John said to them, don't just say to each other we're safe for we're descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. They believed that because they grew up as believers in God, because they went to temple every Shabbat and prayed three times a day and fasted, because they were descendants of Abraham, therefore they were guaranteed a spot in heaven. There was no need for them to repent of their sin. They had this. They were good. Jesus tells a parable about the importance of repentance. He said, two men went up to the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. Standing, but this tax collector standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. So the Pharisee felt no need to confess his sin because, after all, he followed Torah. He was descended of Abraham. He was raised by God-fearing parents. He was descended of Abraham. He had this all covered. The tax collector, on the other hand, knew that he was a sinner. And this is exactly who Jesus said he came to save, those who know they're sinners, those who are in need of a physician. The tax collector also knew something else that the Pharisee couldn't grasp. He knew he needed to repent of that sin. And because he repented, because he came with a humble and broken and contrite heart, he went away justified. Listen to what Paul wrote to the Romans about repentance. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each person according to his deeds. 
without the repentance of sin, Jesus will say to you one day, depart from me, I never knew you. And there you will stand alone to face the wrath of God on judgment day. Not a very pretty picture, is it? Again, how you grew up, what you know about Jesus, and being a Christian, all of that in $50 will get you a coffee at Starbucks. Tell I like Starbucks, huh? John told the Pharisees that God is able to raise up children from among these stones. And so that tells you how much the lineage means to God, doesn't it? Unless you admit that you're a sinner, that you repent of your sin and trust in Jesus as your Messiah, you will not escape the judgment to come. Now this account that John gives closely parallels an account that Jesus had with some Jewish believers who believed also that they had no sin to repent of because of their lineage. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But we are descendants of Abraham, they said. We've never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will be, we, you will be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. So listen, listen to what both John and Jesus are saying here. It doesn't matter if you're raised Christian, if you're raised in a Christian home, if you're descendants of Christian parents, if your father was a Christian, if your grandfather was a Christian, if your great-grandfather was a Christian, if your father was a pastor, maybe your uncle was an elder and your mother led worship. None of that matters. Your lineage, how you were raised, means absolutely nothing to God. Unless you admit you're a sinner and repent of your sin, you still remain a slave to your sin. No amount of good works, no, good, no amount of good behavior, church attendance, speaking the name of Jesus will make you free of your sin. Only submitting your life and surrendering your will to Jesus can set you free. So now you might ask, well, it's not really their fault, is it? No one ever really shared the gospel with them. Listen to what Jesus said. You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So if they only opened up the Bible that they carry around with them every Sunday and read it, Jesus clearly says on the pages of Scripture, you must repent of your sin. Paul lays out the steps to salvation in a book called Romans, and he puts it on what we now call the Romans road to salvation. So ignorance is not going to be a defense on the day of judgment. Because you've had every opportunity to search the scriptures and find out for yourself what the truth of God's word says. But you remain blissfully ignorant, and in the end, Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. So maybe this has hit home for you this morning. Maybe you were raised in a Christian home like the one I described. Maybe you believe that you're saved because your parents were Christians. But listen, there is an old saying that says, you can sleep in the garage, but you're not going to be a car. It doesn't make you a car, right? You cannot enter heaven based on your parents' faith. Your faith must be your own. Your commitment and your surrender to Jesus as Lord and Savior must be your own decision. It can't be a decision that your parents made for you. Or maybe you're a Catholic. That's how I was raised. I was raised a Catholic. Who goes to church on Sundays. You made your first Holy Communion. You made your Confirmation. Maybe you even serve in the Knights of Columbus. Maybe you're on the Ladies' Auxiliary. Maybe you run bingo. Maybe you teach catechism. None of those things, although good things, are going to save you. Not one. Only coming to Jesus as Lord and Savior will save you. You know, I used to read the readings on the altar before the priest presented the gospel, what little of that there was. And I clearly remember in Catholic school a nun telling us, unless you are Roman Catholic, you're not, you can't enter heaven. So I grew up thinking only Roman Catholics were going to heaven. I had no idea what a Roman Catholic even was, but I knew they were going to heaven, so I wanted to get in there with that bunch. The only way they're teaching, the only way to heaven is through Catholicism, right? That's no different than what the Pharisees taught, that because you were descendant of Abraham, you were going to heaven. Jesus said he was the only way to heaven. 
He's the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only life. Not your ancestry. Not your religious affiliation. The only way to heaven is through Jesus. Now maybe you said a prayer on Sunday. Maybe your friend took you to church. Maybe you did this in youth camp. You felt an emotional pull to go forward because you knew it would make your friends and your family happy that you went forward to receive Jesus, right? And you went forward because it was an emotional time, because your friends and family expected you to go forward. But did you realize that you were a sinner, that you were dead in your trespasses and sins, that you desperately needed Jesus to save you? You know, the distance between being a believer and remaining a make-believer is only 18 inches. Did you know that? It's the distance between here and your heart. Do you know of Jesus, or have you given your heart to Jesus? And the way you can know that for sure is that there's evidence in your life of the salvation that you have through a changed life. So why am I causing many to doubt their salvation this morning? Well, Paul told us to examine ourselves. He said, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. I personally think it's healthy to question your salvation. To really take a hard look at what it means to be saved. To know that you know that you know that you know that you are saved. Because I don't believe we have a whole lot of time left on this earth. The time is now to wake up. Take a personal inventory of where you're at with Christ, where your walk is with Christ. Because we shouldn't be spending a whole lot of time figuring out if we're saved or not. We should be spending all our time being about our Father's business. But listen, you can't share the gospel message with somebody if you don't understand what the gospel message is yourself, can you? You know, the Marines have a saying, no man left behind. And we don't want to see any Christians left behind because they falsely believed they were saved and they weren't. So if you want to make sure, if you want to make sure that you are a believer and not a make-believer, I'm going to go over some verses in the Bible at the end of this message that's going to lead you down a road to salvation. Look at verse 33 and 35, if you would, please. Then they said to him, Why did the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees? But yours eat and drink. And he said to them, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and they will fast in those days. So Jesus tells three parables here, beginning with this one. The parable about the bridegroom and fasting, and then the other two refer to a new patch on an old garment and new wine in an old wineskin. And Jesus tells all three of these parables to make a point. They're all connected. Now, some of these people were curious as to why Jesus' disciples didn't fast and pray as often as John's disciples did. Even the Pharisees prayed and fasted more than the disciples of Jesus. I mean, what's up with that? Jesus' response is an odd one, right? He says, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? You know, there was a twice-weekly fast that was made a tradition by the legalistic Pharisees. Even though God's law commanded that there would be only one fast a year, and that was on the Day of Atonement. You could find that in Leviticus 16, verse 29 and 31. The Pharisees, however, as the Pharisees always did, made this more difficult than what it was supposed to be. So they devised a ritual fast twice a week. Now, you could fast at other times. It didn't have to be just this one time a year. You could fast at other times, like if you were waiting for the answer to prayer or for wisdom in a difficult situation, or maybe a sign of grief and mourning. And by the way, we still do this today, don't we? But that's done from the heart. It's, it's not ritually done as the Pharisees were doing. The Pharisees decided that fasting made you look more spiritual. So the more they fasted, the more spiritual they would look, right? They fasted because of the pride that was in their hearts. They wanted others to see that they were spiritual. So Jesus says, can the friends, the wedding attendants, the groomsmen fast while the groomsmen is with them, while the bridegroom is with them? 
And the answer is no. It's a wedding. It's a wedding feast, right? It's a celebration. When the bridegroom's there, we celebrate. So Jesus says, you don't get this, do you? The bridegroom's here. And it would be re completely ridiculous for my disciples to fast and mourn while the bridegroom's here. Now, who's the bridegroom? Who's Jesus referring to? Himself. He's the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah, the Messiah that they've been waiting for day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. He's finally here. So their hearts must have been filled with joy. Can you imagine the excitement and the joy that filled the hearts of the disciples? They understood that they were the poor, they were the prisoners, they were the blind, they were the oppressed that Jesus had come to set free. They were in the presence of Messiah, and they were seeing his power. They were experiencing the miracles. They were hearing his teachings. Fasting for them at that time would have been ridiculous. Jesus said, but the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. And those days would come when those days come, rather, the wedding joy, the feast of that joy, the joy of that feast, rather, would end. And Jesus, of course, is referring to when he returns to his Father in heaven after the crucifixion. So they're celebrating now. Let them celebrate because a time is coming when the bridegroom will be removed from the celebration. And by Jesus referring to himself as the bridegroom, he's establishing an intimate connection here, an intimate relationship between himself, the bridegroom, and the church, the bride. And that's key to understanding how someone could sit in church week after week and think they're saved and are not, because they're missing that intimate relationship with Jesus, a relationship that Jesus describes as a bride and bridegroom. Now, remember when you were first married? Remember you had such joy just being around each other? being in each other's presence, you actually set time aside to spend time with one another. I know that may all seem like ancient history to some of you right now, but you were in love. This was all new to you. You talked about your fears, your hopes, your dreams, your desires, your plans for the future, didn't you? You submitted to one another in love. You had a real relationship with your spouse. You didn't just know of your spouse, right? You intimately knew everything about them, and they knew everything about you. And that's the relationship we should all have with Jesus. We should take everything to him and talk to him about everything. We should know him as deeply as he knows us. The disciples had that kind of intimate relationship with Jesus. John wrote, Jesus, whom... They have heard with their own ears, whom they have seen with their own eyes, and have looked at and touched with their own hands. They knew Jesus intimately. And because they had such an intimate relationship with him, when he was physically gone from their lives, his absence awakened a deep desire in their hearts that they were not fully aware of until they experienced and felt his departure. They longed after that for his presence. They were heartsick because he had been taken from them. And it is then that they fasted. And when you have that personal, intimate relationship with Jesus, and you experience the depth of his love for you, and you get to see his heart, then you will never be content with just knowing of Jesus. You will always long to have that experience of knowing the depths of his heart. Mourning that we cannot be with him physically, at least not yet. But Paul reminds us that the mourning for a believer is different than the mourning for a non-believer. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know that what will happen to believers who have died so that you will not grieve like other people who have no hope. So we have a hope that not only one day we will see our loved ones who have departed before us, but we'll get to see Jesus face to face. And I hope that day comes soon for us. And it is then that will celebrate like we've never celebrated before. Amen? Amen? Look at verses 36 through 39. Then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear, a tear. And also, the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. And no one puts new wine in old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. 
but new wine must be put in new wineskins, and both are preserved. And no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. So these two parables that Jesus tells are similar. They make this they make the same point. And they're related to the parable of the bridegroom and the fasting. In the first parable, if you put an old patch on a a new patch, rather, an old garment, it's not going to match the old garment. You know, this was a big thing when I was growing up, right? My parents would never buy anything new. You just kept patching it and patching it and patching it until you were just wearing a quilt. <laughs> but when you put a new patch on an old garment, after you wash it, there's a chance that it's going to pull away from that garment and make the tear worse, right? The second parable says you can't put new wine in an old wine skin because it will burst. The new wine, because of the fermenting process, expands. And if you put that in an old wineskin that's already shrunk up, it'll cause it to burst and expand and, and will burst. So you can't put new wine in old wineskin because of the pressure of the new wine. So these two parables illustrate that you can't mix old religious rituals with the new faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus' disciples were not fasting along with the Pharisees and John's disciples because they were now under grace through faith in Jesus. Jesus had fulfilled the law. Therefore, there was no longer any need to continue with these old rituals. You see, it will never, ever, ever, ever be Jesus plus works saves you. Ever. It will never be Jesus plus anything that saves you. It will always be because of the finished work on G of Jesus on the cross and his free gift of salvation, that we're saved. And because of that work on the cross, we want to then do good works, right? In, case of the Pharise in the case of the Pharisees, they were consumed by their own self-righteousness. And faith in Jesus can never be combined with our self-righteousness. You can't mix the old wine, or you can't mix rather the old with the new. The beliefs that you've done wondrous works, like feeding and helping the poor, donating to charities, helping your local community, or that you have acted righteously all your life, and fasting and prayed, and, and you're going to church and teaching Sunday school, and you're working the bingos, or even casting out Jesus and casting out demons in Jesus' name. We don't want it to be the other way around. All of that is an old belief that the Pharisees had, that you could become righteous by your own good works. And all of that boils down to a works-based religion. To put it simply, that's what it comes down to. A religion that's created by man to make man righteous in his own eyes. King Solomon said it best, there's nothing new under the sun. None of those things, none of them, although good, can save you. Only confessing your sin and turning to Jesus as Lord and Savior can save you. So how does this all link together? Well, Jesus, in a way here, is uniquely presenting the gospel, isn't he? He's made it clear that he came for sinners, that the only way that they're going to be set free is through him. He didn't come for those who believe they're righteous because they believe their righteousness is what saves them. They feel they have no sin to repent of. So that's not who he came for. And yes, yes, Jesus did come for the whole world. Isn't that what John 3.16 tells us? He didn't come to condemn but to save. That's what John 3.17 says, right? But in order to be saved, you must admit you're a sinner. You must repent of that sin and turn to Jesus. There is an arrogance in the hearts of those who feel they have no need to repent and turn to Jesus. Like the Pharisees, like all those who believe they're saved but have never really confessed their sin, never really surrendered to Jesus. Like those who have come to believe that their good works will save them. Jesus reminds us that the only way to be saved is trusting in him, not our good works. Because when you trust in your works... It's like putting a patch on an old garment or putting new wine in an old wineskin. You can't mix these false doctrinal beliefs with the truth of the gospel, which says you must confess your sin, repent of that sin, turn to Jesus, and trust in him for the forgiveness of sin. The disciples of Jesus didn't just know of Jesus. They knew Jesus. They knew his heart. They knew the depths of his love for them. They knew the extent of his love, and they knew his grace and his mercy. And they were longing to see his face again. Do you have that longing in your heart? Do you want 
to have that longing in your heart. And the only way that you can have that is to establish a close personal relationship with Jesus as Lord and Savior. And to do that, it is as simple as taking a walk down the Roman road. And I'm going to do something today like I've had the blessing and privilege to do every Sunday for the last few months, and that's share the gospel with you. And please know, I don't say any of this with any malice in my heart. I don't say any of this like, ha, ha, na, 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 you're not going to heaven and I am. That's not what any of this is about. I am brokenhearted that there are Christians today who are sitting in church thinking that they are saved and they're not because they've been deceived or because they just haven't been encouraged to read the Bible or because they they don't pay attention to the gospel message. Whatever the reason is, this is a serious issue. And because of the urgency of the time, because of the day that we live in, I implore you to not leave this building this morning if you don't know Jesus. If you haven't made a personal connection with Jesus, if you haven't confessed your sin and asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, don't leave here today until you do. If you're watching this on Facebook Live or, or if you see this on YouTube, don't turn this off until you know that you know that you know that you are saved. So let's take a journey down the Romans road to salvation. And it begins with a reminder. It says, for all of sin, for all have sh fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. We've all sinned. We've all done things that are displeasing to God. There's none who are righteous. There are none innocent. Romans 3, 10 and 12 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Romans 6, 23 teaches us of the consequences of our sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So the punishment that we have earned for our sin is death. Not just physical death, but eternal death. But there's hope. Romans 5.8 declares, But God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ died for us. Jesus' death on the cross paid the debt for our sin. His resurrection proved that God accepted Jesus' payment for our sin. And because of his love for us, it leads us to want to repent. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Romans 2, 4. And once you've admitted you're a sinner and repented of your sin, the next step on the Romans road to salvation is Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will what? Be saved. Because Jesus died for us, all we need to do is believe in him. Put our faith in him. Trust in his death is the payment for our sins, and we will be saved. Romans 10.13 reiterates that. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. He rescued us from death and gave us eternal life. Salvation and forgiveness for our sins is available to anyone who will simply trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And the final stop along the Romans road deals with the results of that salvation. Romans 5.1. This is a wonderful message for all those who believe. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through our relationship with Jesus Christ, we can have peace with God, no longer at enmity with him. Now we are heirs to the kingdom of heaven. Romans 8.1 teaches us, for now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Because Jesus died for us, we will never, those who believe will never be condemned for their sin. And finally, we have this precious promise from God, Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else cre in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Would you like to have that assurance of salvation? If there was a simple prayer that you could pray that gave you that assurance of salvation, would you like to pray that? So I'm going to ask everybody here this morning, just bow your heads. Just bow your heads. This prayer that we're going to pray this morning, and this is for those who are watching online as well. 
maybe more so for someone online watching this. This prayer is in the words of the prayer itself will never save you. It's the heart with which you approach this prayer. If you truly desire in your heart to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, if that is your desire to be his, to know that you know that you know, then I ask you, well, everyone's head is bowed, to just slip up your hand this morning. I mean, maybe you think that you're saved because you grew up Christian. Maybe you think that you're saved because you were a Catholic. I don't know your background, some of you. But if there's anyone here, I see your hand. I see your hand. You can put them down now. Praise the Lord. And I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. And if you mean this with all your heart, if this is truly your desire, then you will be saved, as the Word tells us. Lord, I know I have sinned against you. And I am deserving of death. But you took the punishment that I deserve so that through faith in you, I could be forgiven. I repent of my sin and turn to you, Lord Jesus. As I call upon your name and I place my trust in you for my salvation, I submit my life and surrender my will to you as my Savior. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, and the gift of eternal life. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer with us this morning, welcome to the family of God. When we stand and worship the